Hi, I'm Ranger Karen with the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park. We're one of more than 400 parks that make up the National Park Service, but we're the only one that's dedicated to America's unique art form of jazz. Tonight, we're, I'd like to welcome you to the golden hour. The golden hour is that time of day when the light is perfect and the music is too. Tonight's concert and conversation is gonna be led by Nick Spitzer, the producer and host of the American Roots radio program. And we're gonna be blessed with music by the Jason Marsalis Quintet. With that, I'll turn things over to Nick Spitzer. Thanks, Ranger Karen. This is American Roots from New Orleans with the Jason Marsalis Quintet. Jason is the sixth son of Dolores and Ellis Marsalis Jr. Three of his siblings are jazz musicians, trumpeter Winton, saxophonist Branford, and trombonist Delphio. Jason is the timekeeper who played with his father and notable others, Joe Henderson, Lionel Hampton, and Marcus Roberts. Jason also had the courage to add to his role as a drummer to go to that place where percussion and melody are together, the vibraphone. Pianist, composer, teacher, and father Ellis Marsalis passed on April 1st, 2020. Jason Marsalis Quintet present his father's music. Thank you. 
that Jason Marsalis Quintet. What was the tune there, Jason? That was an original composition of uh, my late father, Alice Marcellus, entitled Oneness. Yeah. It was uh, first recorded uh, back in 1976 on an album entitled Solo Piano Reflections, and um, it actually hadn't been played since. So Is that right? Yeah, so, the, so the, this... Uh, I'm definitely enjoying uh, the music this evening because there's a lot of rare gems of yeah. my father that we're going to be playing tonight. Well, you know, over the years I've noticed you're kind of the family's archivist. You you dig into what everybody's played, what they recorded. You get you deal with their, all their press, their history, and and right now you're really going through your father's archives of maybe some of the less known things. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like there's uh, in fact there's still sheet music that I have to go through. Uh, yeah. There's still some other things that I've got to go through. But yeah, uh, and and who we got here tonight because I know these gentlemen played on uh, one of the recordings by his quintet. Uh, yes, we have um, on piano a uh, former student from the New Orleans Center of Creative Arts, Mr. Shea Pierre. On the tenor and soprano saxophone, Derek Doge. On the trumpet, Ashlyn Parker. And on the bass, Jason Stewart. All right. It's a good-looking crew here, and uh, the sun's going down. It looks beautiful at Esplanade Studios. And uh, what's next in terms of some uh, beautiful music to remember your father by? Well, the next tune that we're going to do comes from an album that was uh, recorded back in uh, between 1981 and 1982. It was during the time when uh, my eldest brother, Linton, had first got signed to CBS Records. And so they did this uh, album uh, entitled Fathers and Sons. And side one had my father and Wenton and Branford on it. And side two had the Freemans from Chicago, Von Freeman and his son, Chico Freeman. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very hard to find album uh, nowadays. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, uh, we're going to do a tune that was written by my father that appeared on that album. It's loosely based on the Herbie Hancock classic, Dolphin Dance. Oh, and lovely. This is entitled A Joy Forever. And nonetheless, if you can't get the record, you can hear the tune streamed right now in the golden hour.
Joy forever. If you're just joining us, this is the Golden Hour on American Roots coming to you from Esplanade Studios right here in New Orleans. Jason, I feel like I need to give you a moment to catch your breath. You're the kind of musician who's got to work it out because you're doing percussion. And I hate to ask you questions. It's like running up next to a runner and saying, so can we talk about life a little bit, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not a problem. I noticed that. <laughs> um, you know, we were talking about... Um, your father a little bit before and, and over the years we, we've talked um, and, and I, I wondered do, do you think of him as somebody that that is a, a nostalgicist in any way because I always thought he was pretty hardcore about the facts and history and, and there's so many song titles we got one coming up called nostalgic impressions and there's a lot of romantic titles in his list but uh, w what's your sense of being close to the man of his his nostalgia or his is just straight ahead qualities yeah well it he was really holistic, I think is the best way to put it. Uh -huh. uh, you know, like he's one that has a holistic view of the world and of people. And even with, even with the music, uh, you know, he would look at it in terms of how it related to things going on around the world. I remember one statement he made to me years ago. When we were having one of these discussions. And, he was, and I remember him saying, well, yeah, man, you know, when, you know, when Louis Armstrong was making those records with the Hot Five, you know, man, Henry Ford and them was cooking. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I was like, oh. Timelines. And, and, but he was talking about just in terms of the level of creativity that yeah. was going on, not just on in the music, but also right. just in the auto industry and things going on across And culture America. and history and commerce and society. Yeah. And so the way that he was is that when it came to music, he, you know, the history was very important, but he would also look forward and also you know, keep up with current things that, that are going on. Um, uh, like... Uh, like even during the time of the 1970s, you mm -hmm. know, and even the 1960s, you know, there was a lot of pop music of the time that he was aware of, and even of the 70s, and, and it, sometimes he and I would have these discussions, you know, if there was a tune from the 70s that right. I might know, he might ask me, well, how is it that you heard that? And I go, well, yeah. I heard it from the he, end. So ch there were a lot of those things that he was aware of. So right. the history was something that was very important, but he also moved forward as well. How about you? What is it you best appreciate about your father's music? Um, hmm, I think for me it would be the, the variety and the different moods and the fact that, you know, he, he never took melody for granted, uh, <laughs> you know, because that can happen nowadays, but that's yeah. another conversation. <laughs> uh, uh, that's the well, thing. Like We've got some guys to help with melody here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's the thing. And I think that, you know, he had such an understanding of music uh, just as a whole. And I, and I can hear that even with how his playing evolved. Like if you hear him, a recording of him in the 1960s and then a recording of him in the 1990s, you hear all this music that has happened since right. that time in his playing. That he's been hearing and then he makes it his own, does yeah. his thing and sounds. So set us up for nostalgic impressions. Yeah, so this was a tune that he wrote in the 1970s for a band that he was leading that he called the Elm Music Company. And from what I understand, uh, I think someone once asked him who had heard the band play live, I think they asked him, well, how is it that everything that you guys play is in thirds or is diatonic? And he said, oh, he had to think about it. And he realized a lot of tunes they had been playing uh, were diatonic. You know, they were doing some, as even then, they were doing some popular tunes of the time that that group would do. So he decided, well, let me write something a little bit outside the mold. <laughs> sort yeah. of. So he came up with this tune. And uh, uh, little did he know that that was a tune that would, you know, influence uh, music uh, really for generations, you know, especially um, his second son, Wenton. This tune had a big mark on a lot of his tunes. All right. Uh, and so uh, this was a tune that was on the Fathers and Sons album and actually has been recorded a few other times. This is entitled Nostalgic Impressions.
to the Jason Marsalis Quintet right now. Cape Town, South Africa, Argentina, Mexico, New Jersey, <laughs> Wilmington, Delaware, Evanston, Illinois, Roswell, Georgia, San Diego, Lexington, San Francisco, Denver, Baton Rouge, and all points in between. So that's nice. We're glad you're out there. You know, in this time where we're isolated, we're also together. And we don't see you. You see and hear us, and we appreciate that. And we're just going to keep on moving along with it. Um, 
you got a tune called Futuristic, so I guess that's the opposite of nostalgic impressions. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe in that moment, I, you know, I was thinking about jazz. I mean, we always talk about the tradition. We talk about Louis Armstrong and New Orleans and Jelly Roll and Beche and, and just so many people. And on the other hand, there's a whole modern sound, contemporary sound. And I think people associate your father more with that contemporary sound. But it, it, he, he listened to it all, it sounds like. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because... Um, uh, when my when my father first started, he wasn't really into the traditional music. Not at right. first. I mean, he was into the music of, you know, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Bebop. Clifford Brown, mm -hmm. Miles, Sun, and, and yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't really until the, I want to say maybe the late 1960s and early 1970s when he started to play uh, traditional music. Really? And, uh, yeah, and... And and those are th and we've had some interesting conversations about that because I, bet. Uh, I did this. In fact, I did this one gig where I was playing uh, <laughs> vibes in uh, this in in this Benny Goodman quartet context, and the guys that I had were all of these veteran musicians from New Orleans who basically have played traditional music more than I have, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he happened to be at the gig. So at the end of the gig, Dad was telling me, "Yeah, man." Yeah, I know what it's like, man, to be at that point, man, you know, and having <laughs> to try to deal with trad music. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I, you know, it was like one of those connected things. Both of us understood that because yeah. he went through that point where there was a language in the music mm -hmm. that, that he didn't know. There were tunes that he didn't know. And sure. uh, so, uh, you know, he, he came to appreciate that more yeah. uh, just over time. And so by the time you get to, you know, like the – 80s and 90s and yeah. at that point he's like well versed in right. just about everything that's happening in the music and things that are about to happen <laughs> in the music as well he's right on the cusp but when he played with al hurt i mean was he what was he playing r&b no 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 what, what no. was the music N no it was that was more i mean they would have like you know some pop tunes but it was right. more in the traditional vein right if, if okay. that makes sense yeah it wasn't really like uh, rhythm and blues like rhythm and blues that would have been more like you know fast domino or something but yeah al hurt wasn't playing music like that it was more uh, uh more towards the traditional vein i wouldn't say like trad all the way but it was more like those kind of things yeah well it's got to be an interesting adjustment to go to trad now how about you did, did you grow up going to uh second lines and jazz funerals and all those i mean culturally did you participate in that or were you kind of away from all that you know what it, it not a i would say not a lot but mm. there were moments uh <laughs> For example, you know, like I was a really big fan of the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. Well, all I right. what it was that they were doing. Yeah. And I remember, uh, you know, and sometimes I might play in a parade. I didn't yeah. do it a lot. I mean, you yeah. had those guys that would do that all the time. Yeah, all the time. I would just do it from time to time. <laughs> and, and there was one time I remember coming home, and maybe my father got this record. But uh, I came home, and there was this album that was by the record player. I was like, oh, Rebirth Brass Band, feel like funking it up. Oh, okay, this looks like... Let me check this out. You Your know, dad had that. Yeah. Look yeah, at that. It, it wasn't mine. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Well, you knew which was yours. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't mine, so I think he got it. Of course, yeah. what I didn't know was that album was going to be a big hit on yeah. most people I went to school with. I didn't right, expect right. it. Right, right. But uh, it wasn't until uh, mm. I started to get together with uh, Dr. Michael White, uh, mm. which was late in high school, early college, and uh, we would get together. The great clarinet player. Music. Yes. Teaches over at Xavier, knows yes. the jazz history like oh, gold. Yeah. And we would and hot. <laughs> the music and the drummers. And, yeah. and then after a while, he started to ask me to play with him, and I started to play gig. Then I started to do yeah. uh, traditional music more, playing playing on the drums. So it All was right. one of those things. I didn't do it a lot as a kid, but as I got older, I did it more and more. You know, I, I love that your dad had the, uh, had the album of uh, Rebirth, was it? Yeah, no, it was. Yeah, yeah. Hey, feel like yeah how, how many times as a kid's dad hip him to new music? Yeah, well, with with, <laughs> with him, you know, not in my life for sure. <laughs> I don't really know, but I think it was sort of it. I think with all of us growing up, it, it was an interchange. Yeah, that's the thing. He'd yeah. have music that I, and then we might have music right. that he hasn't heard. It was like an interchange. Yeah, well, let's come back to family affairs in a little bit. Uh, tell us about futuristic. Let's get there. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, it's another tune. Uh, from from the uh, from the 1970s, and this is also on the Fathers and Sons album, and uh, and we're gonna play that one for you right now. This is futuristic.
Dixon Marsalis Quintet, part of a tribute to his father, Ellis Marsalis Jr. Futuristic is the tune. You know, I was hoping I could find uh, find Shay there across the way. Shay, can you hear me over there? Yeah, I can hear you. Could you lean into your mic just a little bit? Yeah, I can hear you loud. There you go. That's good. You know, I I, uh, I just had to ask you, what's it like to play Mr. Marsalis's part? Oh, it's 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 special every time, man. Um, I feel like with Ellis, he's the pianist that I've had the deepest connection with, even from high school up until now. Like the moment I heard him on the record, I I immediately connected because um, because he had everything there. And I remember coming up, I was one of those uh, cats who really couldn't play fast, so I was forced. Uh, was just kind of forced to focus on melody, and that's what kind of drew me to Ellis because it's like you know he can do all of that, but the melody was so strong. Yeah. And um, also you know I also had the chance to study with him in high school for a bit, and just to kind of speak to the kind of character he had. Yeah. Um, I was paying for the lessons out of my pocket. Um, yep. So once he 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 actually found that out, he would let me come and study with him for free. So that that's just one of the many stories I'm sure that oh, yeah. people have of him. Yeah. Well, well, we'll get to a few more stories. So, uh, Jason, why don't you come back over to the vibes? I, you know, I have to ask you, how, how does somebody who's playing drums, uh, you know, mainly percussion, turn to vibes? That, that is a tall mountain to climb, I think. Oh yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, it was actually my father's idea. <laughs> Because uh, it was in, uh, when we came back to New Orleans, this was like 1989, and I was starting to study percussion. That's who'd been up in Virginia for a while. Yes, we were yeah, up in Virginia. Virginia Commonwealth Richmond. University. Yes, you mm. taught there for three years. And uh, so we had uh, come back, and I was starting to study percussion, uh, like timpani and snare drum. And so he told me, well, you know, you, you should get a set of vibes and start practicing that. And uh, I thought about it, and I said, you know, it's just not a bad idea, actually. Because <laughs> uh, then I started even getting ideas of what could be played. Now, I didn't practice them as much as I should have been, uh, but it was uh, some years later. Everyone says that to themselves at some point. Probably. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it, was some, it was some years later that I decided, all right, let me really get serious about this instrument and doing gigs and so forth, and it was really uh, terrible because I had no technique, but I just kept working on it and working on it. So um, it is a tall order, but it is percussion nonetheless. Right. I was. So gonna say, it's really it where melody and percussion meet. Yes, that is correct. I mean, is there any instrument where they meet quite so no, I mean, tightly? Not in, not in that way. I mean, technically, piano is a percussion. Right. That's actually. true. Yeah. Though that's we have the, the only other strings one, and the keys and yeah, yeah. yeah gotcha. But, but with uh, with you know strum, something that's struck with a mallet. Yeah, so, yeah. But uh, with uh, with uh, keyboard mallets, it's definitely a tall order, but it's. It's uh, worth it to expand one's musicianship. All right. Well, maybe we should issue one more tall order and ask the gentleman in, with the horn section to come back to the band center. Oh, they're going to sit this out, aren't they? Yes, that let is me, correct. Let me retake that. Sorry, gentlemen. <laughs> I was going to engage in chin music, but we'll do that a little later on, maybe. All right? All right. Live yes. <laughs> so what do we got here on the vibes you want to start off with? Uh, uh, this is a tune that uh, my father wrote uh, right before he did a recording session with saxophonist Eddie Harris. And he wrote it, and he almost didn't bring the tune to the session, uh, but he decided against it. Said, oh, let me just bring this anyway. And it ended up being the title selection of the album. Uh, so this is entitled Homecoming. Homecoming, and you're going to be with Shea Pierre on piano. Yes. Duet with vibes and piano, Jason Marsalis.
Jason, tell, just tell us about the vibes for a minute. Maybe you could give us a quick walking tour. I mean, they, they're just magical <laughs> sounding. I mean, they sound like they're from outer space and they're down home and they're incredible. They really make you vibe. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's one <laughs> way to put it. Well, uh, the, you have uh, metal bars and you also have a pedal, uh -huh. which, which gives the notes a sustain. So you right. can go from this to this. And there's also a vibrato, uh, which uh, changes the texture. Uh, like nice. And you can even adjust the speed. Whoa. To where it's like real fast. <laughs> now, now, if you want to play like, like Lionel Hampton, then, you know, that's where like this kind of speed is appropriate, you know. Yeah. Boogie woogie. On the vibes. That yeah. kind of speed. Now, you know, <laughs> if like Milt Jackson, you know, it, it was like a slower speed because right. he was trying to emulate like a like a gospel choir. So that is uh, more like a. Yeah. You know, his was a little slower. Yeah, I think it's going to stay magical no matter what you're doing, who you're playing. There's something about those vibes. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, dropping some mallets here. But uh, also... If you that's know, the least of your problems, man, you know, that's, that's very small. Let me, allow you know, me, it's, it's, allow it's, me to get your man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'll, uh, there's, there's a running joke amongst those who played this instrument where the average person that sees this, uh, if they see an instrument, the first thing they're going to ask you is, is that a xylophone? Mm. And you have to tell them, no, it is not. See, I'm glad I didn't ask that question. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to. Yeah. And so the only way I can try to get them to relate, like, no, the, the vibraphone has this kind of sound. If you've ever heard the, the, the musical logo for the National Brustat Casting Company, oh, that's yeah. a vibraphone. The old NBC. Yeah, now if that's a little too old for you, uh, Maybe you've heard it, you know, for the final Jeopardy category. You know. <laughs> There's that as well. But, you know, you know, maybe you've heard it there. But yeah, that's yeah. Uh, what a vibraphone sounds I'm like. I'm hearing an, an American Roots public radio exchange audio logo in the future here. I can hear it right now. Okay, yeah, it, it, it can happen. You know. <laughs> With that said, uh, what do we got? What's uh, coming up here? Well, now we're going to do a tune. Uh, it's a beautiful ballad uh, from my father's. This is entitled... A moment alone.
love the sustain on the vibes. The moment alone, beautiful. Yes. Yeah, just amazing. Thank you so much for that little duet there. Absolutely. You and Shay. Um, the clock is ticking. Maybe we should get on to a little something about uh, Milt, the groove for bags. Yes. Uh, Milt Jackson. Yes, there was a period that uh, my father, uh, in like the last few years of Milt Jackson's life, actually did some duet gigs mm. with Milt Jackson. Uh, I think Of the had, modern jazz quartet. Yes, yes, the Milt Jackson. And so mm. I think they had same management so he was asked you want to play some Mil gigs with Mill Jackson I said, yeah you know they would do some duet gigs and so forth and and one of the one of the great things that did not happen unfortunately because Milt had passed on my father once asked me yeah man how'd you like to make a record with Mill Jackson I'm like yeah yeah let's do it. yeah let's do it but unfortunately Milt passed on so it didn't happen mm. uh, but this was a thing that he wrote that was reminiscent of Milt Jackson and uh, not only his playing, but his work with the modern jazz quartet, because my father was really big into the modern jazz oh, quartet. Oh, sure. And so we're going to do a thing entitled A Groove for Bags. It's a little play on the title Bags Groove, I might yeah. add. And a play on the tune, too. Oh, Bags yeah. Groove as well. Got to play on the tune and the words. Yep. So two choruses. Mm. Two. Ah, 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 ah. group for bags. I love it. Jason yes. Marsalis there on the vibes with Shea Pierre on the piano. And uh, let's get our gentlemen back to the bandstand for the full quintet upcoming. We've got uh, Derek Doge on saxophones moving to the center stage over there. And coming right around behind him, Ashlyn Parker on trumpet. And Jason Stewart back picking up the stand-up bass. You know, uh, I, I just have to ask you while the guys are getting set, is there any way you can say in just a few words, what was it like growing up in a household 
where four people are musicians. I know you've been asked that, and, and there could be a you know a thousand page book about this, I suppose, if someone wanted to write it. Um, but just your sense of it, you're the sixth son. You saw some of it happen, but you also got a lot of instruction from those who came before. Well, here's the thing that I have to clear up every time. Okay. When I was growing up, there was actually two of us. Oh, because the others had gone on. Yep, that's right. See, Ooh. I was born uh, in, in, you know, in 77, and so the following year, Branford left to go to college. Mm. And then the year after that, went and left, went to Juilliard, went to New York. And then a few years after that, Ellis III, he left uh, to go to, uh, well, he went to New York also. In and, my, and later Delphio. Baltimore. He's been a uh, yes, photographer. Yeah, he's, a, he's in Baltimore now. And a documentarian. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Delphio, he went to Berkeley and Boston. So when I was coming along, w w you know, by the time I was six years old, they were all out of the house. So yeah. it was just me and uh, my uh, oldest, Mboya. Mboya uh, and so, your mom and dad. Yeah. So there was a lot of time I had with uh, my father, obviously. And I would see my brothers nice. on occasion. You know, now I did spend a lot of more time with Delphio because there was a period where he was back in New Orleans. And, and he actually, lives in New Orleans now. Yeah. And yeah, the so other guys are in what North Carolina and, and New yeah. York and. Uh, yeah. So it's it's real spread out now. Yeah. It's really yeah. spread out now. But still, the question is, I mean, what kind of how would you describe just the intimate family that you were with? Uh, well, I, I would say that I was a privileged musician. <laughs> uh, that's how I'd put it. Because uh, I, well, had, I can't I had, argue with that. Yeah, I had uh, you know access access to any music that I had wanted to check out, and it didn't matter what it was. And I was never told that I had to go in a certain direction or have to play a certain kind of music. It just wasn't about that. It was yeah. whatever. The, the main goal was whatever it is that you play, play it on a high level, whatever it was. Well, we're privileged to have all of you guys here. The quintet is back in order. What do we got coming up? This is a tune of uh, my father's that, uh, once again, this has not been played since probably the, the late 1970s, and there's no recording of it. So I guess it's sort of a world premiere for, for most people. And uh, this is a thing entitled Three in One.
someone just wrote us said, this is an awesome tune. I have to agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, first time it's been played in like a very a long while. In fact, um, one funny anecdote about this. Um, three and one we're talking about. Yeah, yes, three and one. Uh, th I was uh, listening to this old reel-to-reel -reel of uh, a gig that my father did, and, and so I was, there was a tune I didn't recognize, and so my father walks by and he says, oh, yeah, three and one. Yeah, yeah. And then after a while, he says, yeah, it was kind of a corny tune. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, you know, I, that, but it recently, though, I did uh, find some sheet music for it and, uh, you know, decided, you know, there might be enough to make this work. Now, I will yeah. admit there was one section in the yeah. sheet music that was corny. <laughs> I will be honest and say I looked at it and I said, no, we're not going to do that. You mean you've offered critiques of your dad over the years? But man, we all critique each other. I, I've noticed every we time all, around believe your brothers. Me, I got some stories about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah stories yeah. about records. Yeah, and we didn't talk food fights. being critical yet. of records, saying <laughs> that this is sad and this wasn't happening. Believe me. Hey, but that's what gives you all the creative edge to keep it moving, you yeah, know? Well, we're just trying to play music on the highest level. And if someone does it, you're going to hear about it. Oh, yeah. Hey, speaking of high level, could you, uh, gentlemen in the horn section, get a little near the mic? Microphone. We have burning questions from people across the country for you, uh, like, where did you get that hat? <laughs> Trumpetmafia.com. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, <laughs> good. Shameless. That's good. That's good. Shameless. Uh, it's a Stetson. It's a Stetson, yes. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So you can go to the Stetson but catalog. But the teeth are from Australia, so you're going to have to make go to Texas and Australia to get the Okay. Get, you get you get have to make up some big places far away maybe to go get it. And, uh, uh, by the way, that uh, that's... Uh, uh, Ashlyn Parker speaking, who grew up in North Carolina. Uh, just maybe for both of you, um, w what is it like to play horns together on Ellis Marsalis's music? What are the, what are the things that make it different, special, unusual? Uh, the I, I would say the we got Derek Doge about to tell us the most unique and the funnest thing about um, playing together with Ashlyn and with Ellis was actually. Uh, the the focus of, of ours mostly on the gig was to try to make Ellis laugh. <laughs> um, he and, could and be a bit stoic at times. Sure, uh, <laughs> and and not even just laugh, but try to try to make him uh, interested in what we were doing. So sure. we would take melodies that were plucked from a different song, and fly them into the song that we were playing. See if he's noticing. And try to and try to crack <laughs> him up. That was that was uh, the funnest thing that we could do on the gig. Yeah, yeah, you 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 you're laughing along on that one, man. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean that was th that was the name of the game, you know. Um, but here's the thing: uh, as as clever as we ever thought we what you know we were doing and right. trying to crack him up, he al he always beat us at yes. the game. Yes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> he yeah. beat everybody. He, yeah, and the stuff that he would quote would ju we we'd never heard before. I mean, so does that give you deep sympathy for Jason growing up around uh, his dad? <laughs> No, no. With, with Jason's skill set, he gets no sympathy from me. Okay. Well, then, well let's, let's move to the next generation then. <laughs> For sure. All right. Now, um, back there, uh, back there on the base, uh, Jason, another Jason, Jason Stewart. You've known Jason Marsalis a long time. Yeah, and his father. I mean, uh, I guess we probably met in the late '80s. Yeah. Is when we met, and then. Uh, so we've been playing together ever since then, on and off in different configurations right. and then uh you know the first gig i did with his father i think was 91 i was uh 19. Mm. yeah and you were at noga but he wasn't there then new orleans center for creative no, arts no uh the great clyde kerr jr was the teacher there legend legend ellis had left and gone to virginia before he came, came back, came back and he was at UNO. I, I think University. he was at UNO when I started at NOCA, right. but University of New nevertheless, Orleans. he wasn't at NOCA anymore. Yeah. So, so as a bass man, I mean, how does the music, uh, you know, challenge you, create what you're interested in, well, make you crazy? Uh, wh what does it do for you to play this music? All of the above. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's challenging, but it's also his writing is very logical, and you know. Like some sometimes some of the tunes that we played and maybe that we're playing today, uh, Jason, you know, you kind of dug them out and and rewrote them. But it's kind of interesting how Ellis's compositional style is immediately picked up and you're able to kind of complete it. You know what I mean? There's there's such a coherent logic to it. Yeah. Well, and and the, you three gentlemen, uh, I mean, Jason was producing. You were on. Uh, the quintet sessions, Ellis Marsalis yeah, yeah. Uh, plays Ellis Marsalis. Yeah. Yeah, kind I mean, of amazing. Uh, I guess this was kind of the quintet for the last years of his life. You know? Yeah. 
it was uh, playing Ellis's music was uh, wasn't the hardest part of the gig because he actually had music and charts for that. The hardest part of his gig was all the other stuff that we did because we didn't have any music or we never talked about rehearsing or he never told me, hey, Derek, we're going to play these tunes on this gig. We He would just start playing. Occasionally there'd, there'd be out. a new member of the band and they'd be like, what are we going to play first, Mr. Marcellus? And he'd be like, I'll tell you when we get up there. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Hey, a little improvisation on the bandstand, huh? <laughs> yeah, we never knew what was going to happen. Oh, well, that, that keeps you on edge. Yeah. The, the funny thing is, is he, he was fearless uh, in that same situation. If a singer comes to sit in, he's like, uh, wants to, she wants to do a song. He, he hasn't played it in 45 years, <laughs> but he's fearless. He, you know, so Let's go. He liked the hot seat, too. So. Mm. <laughs> yep. Well, we got one called On Time. I think it's our last song of the night. The clock is ticking. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, t tell us a little about On Time. <laughs> yeah. Actually, um, you know what? Since, uh, since uh, uh, yeah, this one um, we're going to do. This is a tune that uh, my father actually wrote in 85 with, um, uh, it was a quartet that he had with uh, a drummer named Noel Kendrick, bassist Reginald Veal, and Victor Goins on saxophone. And uh, and this this tune is interesting because it was very influenced by like the 1980s and that style of composition. And so uh, and it, it was a tune that was unfinished. And so I remembered recently like that he had wrote this tune and I went through his sheet music and found it and decided, man, I, I need to finish this tune. This is a great one. So uh, and of course, on time was an, an expression for being late. So uh, I guess this tune is on time. So right. this is the one we're going to do for you now. Jason Marsalis Quintet, Golden Hour, American Roots from New Orleans.
On time, just about uh, time to say good night. But uh, we've got a little bit more time, and the first thing we want to do is bring up Ranger Karen to tell you uh, who's been helping us make this happen. Well, on behalf of the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park and the National Park Service, I want to thank everyone who's tuned in from all around the world this evening. Uh, I want to encourage you to check out the Facebook page of the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, where you'll find lots more concerts by New Orleans musicians. And I really want to thank Nick Spitzer of American Roots and the Jason Marsalis Quintet for providing the music tonight. Thanks again, everybody, and I hope you'll keep tuning in to the Golden Hour. All right. I got to admit, I'm a big fan of the Park Service. I used to hike around the parks. But look at this, a park that supports performance in a time of need, taking care of musicians here. And uh, we hope everybody out there has a sense of the example of streaming with great quality like we have in the Golden Hour. And uh, you get to hear some of these, uh, these things a little bit later on on American Roots and we reproduce it all uh, for radio. Uh, Jason and all, I just wanted to say that somebody wrote us and said, I fell in love uh, listening to your father's music at Lou and Charlie's on Rampart Street circa 1975. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was before your time, I guess. Yes, it was. <laughs> but I'm sure that a lot of people fell in love uh, listening to uh, Mr. Marsalis, and we've enjoyed it tonight. And uh, we do have time uh, for one more here at the beautiful uh, Esplanade Studios on Esplanade Avenue here in New Orleans. Some have been asking what this old Presbyterian church is doing, being a recording studio. Well, this is what it's doing, the golden hour in American Roots. But uh, tell us what you got in mind here to uh, say goodnight. Speaking of Lou and Charlie's, uh -huh. uh, the band that my, my father led at the time was a group he called the Elm Music Company. Uh -huh. And this is a tune that he actually wrote for that band. And uh, fortunately, it, this is one of the things that was brought back and he was able to play in the last few years and it appears on that music of Elvis Marcellus Quintet album. This is entitled Dippy. And Dippy, I won't say it sounds like the name, I will just say that this is old school, New Orleans cool, circa 60s, 70s, and it's a sound we don't get to hear much, so it's a beautiful thing. Dippy with Absolutely. the Jason Marcellus Quintet.
Jason Marsalis Quintet playing Dippy, led there by Jason on drums and xylophone. Ashlyn Parker on trumpet, <laughs> Derek Doge on saxophones, Jason Stewart on bass, and Shea Pierre on piano. Wow. I want you to join us next week for Layla McCalla with Creole banjo man Don Vappi and accordion and fiddle player Cedric Watson. This is American Roots with the Golden Hour. Thanks to the National Park Service, Elephant Quilt Productions, Esplanade Studios, and our American Roots team. And thousands of you listening all over the world. I forgot to say Armenia, Ohio, Michigan, Chicago, Bucks County, PA, Cambridge, St. Paul, Concord, Vancouver, Phoenix, whatever uh, time of day it is, wherever you are. Bonsoir, buenas noches, guten Nacht. Good night from New Orleans. <laughs>